Welcome back. Good morning. Um, so today we have, uh, I'm starting and I'm going to talk about protoplanetary disks. And then after the break, uh, Charles is going to be taking over, talking about uh, black hole accretion. Um, so there's going to be a big, uh, big range of energy scales today. Okay. So, um, so Sasha asked me to discuss protoplanetary disks. So this is definitely the, uh, the low point of the school in terms of energy. So we're going to be talking about 10 or 100 Kelvin gas, so very low, very low temperatures, very low energies. And then uh, after that, we're going to be moving to black holes. And then uh, tomorrow, we're going to be going to plasmas and, and things like that. So one of the nice things about protoplanetary disks is that we have some, uh, some very nice and recent images of those systems. So we should start with this. These are images from the, the D-Sharp survey, which was uh, published last year. It's just a subset of the, of, the, uh, of the systems that they looked at. Um, and these are images made with, with ALMA. So this is radio, radio emission um, at a wavelength of about a, of about a millimeter. So what you're looking at here is emission from, from dust in these disks. Um, scales here are 50, 100 astronomical units, in some cases a little bit larger than that. And the, the sort of striking thing and the, the main result of uh, this survey, um, which many of you will have, will have seen, is that there's a lot of non-trivial structure in these, uh, in these systems. Okay? So they're not purely radially smooth um, declining profiles of dust surface density emission. Uh, instead, in many of these systems, you see these, you see these rings of emission. And then in some of them, uh, you see some, some other kinds of structure uh, some asymmetries in the, uh, in the azimuthal direction, or spiral arms, um, and so forth. So this is, what we're, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about disks of, of gas and dust surrounding young stars, lasting for maybe a few million years, um, and presumably within which um, planets are forming. OK, so there's sort of two, two, at least two, different reasons why we might be interested in those, uh, in those systems, which have sort of motivated my choice of which things about protoplanetary disks to, to talk about in this, um, in this school. So one aspect is that these are accretion disks. Okay? So we can actually observe uh, indirectly, but, but, but uh, with high confidence, gas flowing through these disks and being accreted onto the, onto the star. And the typical accretion rate you might get here is something like 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year. Okay, so over a few million years, um, you would you know, accrete a, a significant or a non-negligible non fraction of a, of a solar mass. And presumably at earlier times, the accretion rate would be, would be higher. So these are accretion disks, and specifically they're examples of geometrically thin accretion disks, in the sense that if we look at the vertical structure of the disk, the vertical scale height is a small fraction of the distance to the central star. And it's not a not a vanishingly small fraction in these systems, so value of um, 0.05 might be a fairly typical number. Uh, so it's a, it's a thin structure, but it's not, it's not an absolute sheet like uh, something like Saturn's rings. And there are other accretion disks which you know, have that same property. That's sort of in some sense the most uh, the classical example of accretion disks that have these, uh, these thin structures. There are also examples of geometrically thick accretion disks, which we'll be hearing more about um, in the context of black hole accretion. So these are accretion disks, and from that point of view, the nice thing is that these are systems which can actually be spatially, spatially resolved. Here, here you have uh, eight examples of, those, um, of that imaging. Okay. And not only can they be spatially resolved, if you look in molecular line emission, so this is dust emission here, but you can also look in emission of molecules such as CO, HCO+, other species, and by looking at those molecular lines, you can measure the velocity in principle at each point in, in this image. So you can have both spatial resolution and also spectral resolution or, or velocity resolution. So that's a, a fairly, well, that's a unique si situation in the context um, of accretion disks and gives, gives a way to maybe say something about um, you know, what's going on in accretion disks, okay? how much turbulence there is, uh, questions like that. And then, of course, the second point, reason you might be interested is, is as an environment for, for, for planet formation. And as many of you will have, will have heard, um, there's a popular interpretation that these rings in particular that you see in these images are actually due to, due to planets. And the basic sort of idea would be 
that you know here in this system somewhere here maybe 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 here there's a there's a planet perhaps whose mass is comparable to Neptune in the solar system something like that and what you're seeing here is that that planet has excited waves in this disk and is trapping dust particles um, sort of in, in the regions between those waves, roughly speaking. Okay. So, yeah, there's obviously a lot of questions there about, well, first of all, whether that's the correct interpretation of this, of this data, um, and if so, what that says about how quickly planets are forming in these systems. Okay, so we won't, we won't get into those, those interesting questions. So based on that, um, what we're going to talk about today is, is sort of two topics. One, which is, in what sense are protoplanetary disks just like other accretion disks, and in what sense are they, are they different? Uh, at, at the center of, of this whole, whole system? Yeah, so here, he, here you'd have a, a young star. So uh, yeah, the systems we're mostly thinking about are stars with masses similar to the sun or somewhat, or somewhat lower. Okay, so Situation is a little bit different if you were thinking about very massive stars, uh, which would have a you know very large ionizing radiation output. So here we're talking about mostly low mass, low mass stars. And in these sort of images, you should sort of think of the star as having uh, acquired most of its final mass, but you know not yet having a um, a, a main sequence stellar structure. So it's still it's still got some way to go. Right, so the question is how you, how you measure the thickness. Well, so, so here, you know, here you're not sort of getting at the thickness directly. Um, there are other classes of observations where you can, for example, see the disk edge on, and you see scattered light from the upper and lower surfaces. So there you can relatively directly get at the thickness. Um, you can actually get at the thickness from images like this as well, but you know, that's a, a modeling exercise rather than a you know, sort of direct read off the, read off the image. Probably. Probably, actually, so this is emission from moderately large particles. It's not really tiny dust particles. So probably, actually, the, the, the emission is actually thinner here than the, than the gas. That's the general interpretation. Uh, so here, there are not so many companions. So these, these would be basically remnants of clumps in a molecular cloud after it's, after it's collapsed. So the sort of picture you would have is you know, a large, large molecular cloud, maybe, maybe with hundreds of thousands of solar masses and material, but then the, the, the clumps in that have collapsed down, and this is the material with angular momentum that has formed a disk around it. So these are transient, transient structures that are sort of left over from the star formation process. So it's generally thought to be, let's say, of the order of 3 million years, 5 million years, maybe up to 10 million years. Um, so you know, that's, let's say, if we just say it's up to 10 million years, no one is going to argue with us too much. If you get to whether it's 3 million years or 5 million years, the difficulty is that it's quite hard, very hard, to put an accurate age date on a, on a young star. So you can, you can have some uh, uncertainty due to, due to that. That's a, that's, a, that's a tricky question. <laughs> so how the properties vary with mass is measured, I would say, but not very well understood. You know, so for example, I think the, the most secure result is that if you measure the sort of typical accretion rates as a function of stellar mass, those have a scaling that is steeper than linear, which is sort of not, not an obvious thing, right? <laughs> and what that really says, whether that's saying something about how the disk is evolving or more about the initial conditions or you know, what it was like when it was formed uh, is not, not a completely settled question, I would say. Okay. So yeah, so there's sort of two things we can talk about which are related to these, these issues. So one is, in what sense are protoplanetary disks accretion disks 
like other accretion disks, and in what sense are they different? And the obvious reason that they're different is that they're very cold. So as I was saying, you know, if you're close to the star, you might be dealing with obviously temperatures that are similar to stellar photospheric temperatures, so thousands, a few thousands of degrees Kelvin. But then if you get out to 100 AU, the temperatures are more like tens of Kelvin, or even, or even 10 Kelvin. Okay, so very, very cold, and therefore very weakly, um, very weakly ionized. So in the context of, of what Blakesley was talking about yesterday, uh, we're sort of below the bottom of the, the plasma part of, of her plot in the region where the ionization fraction is very weak. Okay? And it's interesting that you know, MHD is sort of valid at all in that region. Um, and we'll be talking about how that, how that goes. And then the other thing is, you know, one of the main reasons we're interested here is, is making planets, so making, making solid objects mostly, right? things like the Earth. Um, and we also observe a lot in, in dust. Okay. So we've got gas and we've got dust, and in interesting regimes, those are coupled together aerodynamically. Okay. So there's really just aerodynamic coupling between solid particles which are moving relative to the local gas frame. So we have a, a two-fluid system, if you like, where one fluid is gas, the other is dust, it's pebbles, maybe later it's planets, which wouldn't have aerodynamic interactions, but would have gravitational interactions, and we can be interested in how those, how those things play together. So those are the, uh, those are the topics we're going to discuss. So we're going to start with discussing um, non-ideal MHD, which is a, a large topic in its, in its own right. And I think what I'm going to try to uh, get through today is to give you at least a, a sketch of how the equations of MHD, which we've already discussed, ideal MHD, um, are modified when we have this low ionization fraction, which is very, very characteristic of protoplanetary disks. Um, as you were hearing yesterday, you know, this also takes place in, in star formation, but in a, but in a slightly different regime. Right? So star formation, uh, we're dealing with extremely low densities, and so that means that different, different non-ideal effects um, come in to matter more. So give a sketch of the derivation and say something about which of the non-ideal terms, turns out there are three of them, um, matters in different regions of the, of the disk. Okay, so that's sort of, if you like, specifying the problem from the point of view of how you would try to simulate it or, or study what's going on in different parts of the disk. And then just say a little bit um, about some numerical approaches and you know, show some results uh, of which, what people have obtained in that, in that regime. So that'll be part one. And then, you know, depending on how much time we have, so feel free to ask, ask questions. We don't absolutely have to get through all this, um, all this stuff. So if there's questions, do, do stop me. But if we do have time, we'll say something about um, this two fluid um, dynamics, say something about what the problem is there, um, mention something about the fact that when we have two fluids which are interacting with each other, an interesting property is that that can give rise to new instabilities which are not present in each of the individual fluids. So their coupling can, can if you like, destabilize the, um, the system. And again, we'll say something about um, some numerical approaches to that problem, and again, show, show just, just one result, basically, um, that comes up in that, in that system. OK, so let's start by discussing this question of um, non-ideal MHD. And let's start with the uh, thing we've uh, already discussed in this, uh, in this school, which is, which is ideal MHD. So we have the induction equation here, and as was discussed yesterday, this represents physically a situation where the magnetic field, the magnetic flux, is perfectly frozen into the, into the fluid. Okay? And so we can consider it in sort of two different limits if you want. You can imagine first that a magnetic field that is extremely weak, so it doesn't exert any significant back reaction on the, on the fluid, and then the fluid is moving around however it, however it pleases, and the magnetic field is being carried around potentially tangled up by that, by that fluid motion. You could also imagine a situation where the magnetic field is stronger, um, and then it will back react on the, uh, on the fluid through the, through the momentum equation uh, and the Lorentz force term in that, which was also discussed yesterday. Okay. So that's ideal MHD. And the first thing to note is you know, ideal MHD is always an approximation, of course, as was, as was emphasized yesterday. And there's always more stuff on the, on the right-hand side of, um, of this equation. And in general, in, let's say, many astrophysical systems, in principle, we sort of have to worry or should worry about the, the extra term, even if ideal MHD is itself a very good approximation. So if we're dealing with, you know, let's say, a, a very well-ionized system, 
where the, uh, the, uh, the ideal MHD seems like a, you know, a good thing. And the reason for that is that if the system particularly is, is turbulent, then it will be you know, stirring around this uh, magnetic field, and you'll get this sort of spaghetti-like um, structure to the, to the magnetic field. And so very often, that will both amplify the magnetic field, make it stronger, and it will also mean that the scale on which the magnetic field reverses direction tends to become smaller with, with time. Okay, so it's sort of like one of those uh, stirring, stirring a coffee cup with some cream, and you get smaller and smaller structures as, as, as the mixing progresses. And so if you're in purely ideal MHD, that just, that just continues. The magnetic field gets stronger, and it gets to smaller and smaller scales. But obviously, eventually, something, something breaks there. And that was what was being discussed a little bit yesterday in terms of, of reconnection and so forth, things that go beyond the, the ideal MHD approximation. OK, so there's, particularly in, uh, well, in, in many circumstances, but you know, in disk circumstances as well, um, you know, what happens on those small scales um, is interesting and, and raises some sort of interesting, uh, interesting questions. So in well-ionized systems, the, like the breakdown of ideal MHD um, is occurring on, on small scales due, due to things like current formation of current sheets and so forth. And from a numerical point of view, that has the consequence that often we're dealing with circumstances where none of the dissipative effects that are, that are present in the fluid, so due to the, the, the finite conductivity of the fluid or due to its uh, viscosity, where none of those are properly resolved numerically. Okay. And so this is a uh, you know, sort of uh, an interesting difference between astrophysical fluids and, in particular, you know, engineering fluids. If you sort of speak more within uh, engineering type communities, people are very concerned about simulations where you do not have the correct Reynolds number, right? Where you're not you're not really representing the the uh, the true nature of the uh, of the fluid. But in astrophysics, very often, very very frequently, that's that's the case. If you think about something like the sun, dissipation scales are much much smaller than any kind of numerical scale you can resolve. So you have to you have to deal with that, and there are sort of some interesting questions there, um, you know, related to do the small scales in some way feedback on the on the large scales. So, for example, if you consider, you know, what's the ratio of the viscosity to the resistivity, you know, that number can vary quite a lot depending on what the, the plasma properties are. And there's discussion about if you go to different regimes of that so-called Prandtl number, um, does that in fact affect the large scales of the flow? as well as the small scales of the flow. Okay, so those are, those, are, those are interesting questions. Um, however, when we get to protoplanetary disks, we're dealing with a, a different situation because the, the extra terms on the right-hand side are not just uh, things that matter on small scales. They're actually things that matter on, on large scales. Okay, and so that's the, the, uh, like the unusual aspect, perhaps, of, of protoplanetary disks. It's non-ideal MHD. We have to worry about the non-ideal terms, and they're actually large in magnitude in many circumstances. And that comes about because the, the ionization level is, um, is low. So we can say just a little bit about um, the physics of the, of the ionization, but that's a, a complicated topic in its own right. And you can sort of think about two ways in which the, the gas in the disk might be ionized. So one reason it might be ionized is just that it's hot, and so it's collisionally, collisionally ionized. And nowhere in the disk, at least in, let's say, low accretion rate systems, is the temperature going to get large enough to really significantly ionize hydrogen? Okay, so the, the bulk species in the disk is going to be is going to be neutral no matter what. But then there are other species um, which have lower ionization potentials, which will be ionized at lower at lower temperature. Okay, so these are things like like the alkali metals like sodium and potassium. And so you get some ionization of those at temperatures that are more like a thousand degrees Kelvin rather than the 10,000 degrees Kelvin um, you would think of for, for hydrogen. Okay. And on the, on the left there, there's just a, um, an estimate of what uh, sort of ionization degree you would get from, from those effects, making some assumption about uh, the abundance of the, alkali, of the alkali metals. And the point is just that you've got very low degrees of ionization um, from that sort of process. So you might be looking at 10 to the minus 13 at a temperature of about 1,000 Kelvin. So an overwhelmingly neutral uh, system just from the point of view of thermal ionization. So that's at 1,000 degrees Kelvin. If you go out to where the, where the Earth was forming, you might have temperatures of uh, a few hundred degrees. 
if you go out to where you know, Jupiter or, or Uranus and Neptune were forming, you might have temperatures below 100 degrees. So in that, in that uh, circumstance, the thermal ionization contribution is completely negligible. However, you also have non-thermal ionization from various sort of high energy sources of radiation in the system. Okay, and there's various ones of those. So the star itself is going to be producing ultraviolet photons, so far ultraviolet photons for sure. Um, it's going to be producing X-rays. Young stars are quite uh, vigorous X-ray sources. And then there may be cosmic rays, which are you know, in the environment, in the star-forming environment, which are, which are coming in and impacting the disk. And all of those things will, will of course, ionize the, um, will ionize the fluid. And even if you didn't have them, there are some short-lived radioactive species. Aluminum-26 is uh, the most important, which will be decaying and producing high-energy particles, which can also cause some ionization. So you have all those ionizing sources, which will be like shining on the disk, in the, in the case of the, the X-rays, the FUV, the cosmic rays, from outside, um, and they will, be, they will be producing ionization. But the important point here is that even though those species have some, uh, some penetration depth, it's generally small compared to the co total column of the disk, at least relatively close to the star. So that's what's being shown on this, on this plot. Here is the, the column density in grams per square centimeter, where you imagine this is the, the upper part of the disk, and then you're going to the right down towards the, the disk midplane. Okay. And at one AU, you might have uh, a column density of 1,000 or a little bit more than 1,000 grams per square centimeter uh, down to the midplane, and that will be enough to attenuate even, even cosmic rays, which are the blue curve in this case. Okay. So that will be they will be basically be wiped out exponentially because they have a, a stopping depth of, a, of order 100 grams per square centimeter. And X-rays, which are more securely known to be present in young stars and also have a high, high luminosity, um, those have a, a shorter penetration depth, and so those get cut off exponentially even, uh, even stronger. So that's the ionization story. If you want to know what the ionization fraction is, you also have to worry about the uh, recombination, which is a whole different story. But the bottom line is that you end up with very small ionization degrees. So 10 to the minus 13, less than 10 to the minus 13, uh, let's say, in the terrestrial planet forming region of the, uh, of the protoplanetary disk. So the question is, what does, that, um, what, does that, what does that do to you? So in terms of, uh, in terms of the physics, it's sort of relatively straightforward. Uh, so here we imagine we have, uh, we have a magnetic field, and we now have uh, a plasma, if you like, in that magnetic field, but the ionized contribution is actually very, very small compared to the neutral contribution. So we have uh, negative charge carriers, positive charge carriers, and neutrals in that, in that system. And as I was saying, the neutrals outweigh the, the, the charges by 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14, or some number like that. Now, if we just think about the electrons and the ions, uh, they interact with the magnetic field just in the same way that they would in, in ideal MHD. Okay? So those are tied to the magnetic field. We can think about them as, as gyrating around these, uh, these field lines. The neutrals, on their own, of course, don't care anything at all about the, the magnetic field. So the circumstances we have, you know, most of the mass, in principle, doesn't care about the magnetic field directly, but the charge component um, does. And so I'll just try to illustrate here, in the, these kind of systems, the negative and the positive charge carriers are not equivalent, right? So we're not dealing with electrons and positrons for sure here. We're dealing with uh, negative charge carriers that may be electrons, free electrons in the gas. The positive charges may be positively charged molecules, for example. So much, much heavier species than the, than the electrons. Okay, so then we can then imagine, you know, applying an electric field to, to this system and asking what will, what will happen. You can even consider not ha even having an electric field. Um, and so if we well, put a field there, the, the charged particles will, will tend to want to, will want, to, will want to drift. Negative charges in one direction, the positive charges um, in another. And if those charges collide with the neutrals, then those collisions will provide some coupling between, if you like, these, these separate fluids in the, in the system. So that's what's, that's what's going on. We've got neutral, neutral fluid and a, and a charged fluid. Um, they have different sort of basic interactions, but they're coupled 
uh, due to the fact that they collide with each other. And where it gets sort of complicated or, or interesting is that how that works um, depends on the density and therefore on the rate of these, of these collisions. And you can sort of imagine three different uh, regimes. So one is at relatively high density, where you've got these charged particles, they're trying to drift, but they're colliding very, very frequently with the, with the neutrals. Okay. So that's a high density regime, and in that case, the, the drift speed is going to be completely limited by these, these collisions. Okay. So in that case, if you like, things are actually quite well coupled together, but the collisions will tend to dissipate the, the current itself. Okay. So that's the regime of, of ohmic diffusion. Okay. So in sort of a big picture where you're thinking of non-ideal MHD, if you're dealing with high-density systems or thinking about the breakdown of, I, uh, of MHD in, in you know, other systems, uh, ohmic diffusion is often the first thing you, you think about. Now, you can also imagine a situation of very, very low density. Okay? So if you have very, very low density, the electrons and the, um, uh, and the ions are tied to the magnetic field, and they're almost independent of the, um, of the neutrals uh, completely. If you go to low enough densities, you could really imagine that the, um, the charged particles are interacting with the magnetic field in their own way, and the neutrals are just sort of sitting there not really caring about, about what's going on at all. Go to slightly higher densities, there is some uh, coupling, um, but there can be drift, or will be drift, between the charged species and the, and the neutral species. And that's the regime we describe of as, as ambipolar diffusion, which is the main effect that people mainly discuss in the context of, of star formation. And then there's an intermediate regime, which occurs because in this system, the ions and the electrons are not equivalent, where you can have one of the species tied to the magnetic field, um, and the other not so much. Okay, and so that comes in at some intermediate densities, and that's related to the, to the, to the Hall effect. So that's the, um, that's the physical situation. Um, and I should say, I think this is a, a reasonably uh, straightforward physical picture. How this gives rise to the actual non-ideal terms uh, is not something that I ever find very intuitive. So I'm going to explain sort of mathematically or physically where it comes from but sort of tying it to this picture of, of how well things are coupled to the, uh, to the, to the field and so forth um, is something that I don't think is, is completely easy. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Okay, so we want to do something that's, that's, that's MHD-like. Okay? And as was sort of said uh, yesterday, uh, you know, MHD is actually, you know, when you sort of think about it, is, um, involves a, it's like a little bit of, of, of magic or, or surprise. Okay, because when you think about MHD, just ideal MHD, we're thinking about plasma systems, and we're thinking about currents. Right? So when, we, when you are introduced to magnetic fields and electromagnetism, it's all about currents and how those source magnetic fields, about wires, magnetic fields going through the wires, all this kind of, all this kind of thing. But in the MHD description of things, um, a lot of that doesn't really appear explicitly in the, uh, in the equations. So it's a plasma system, so we definitely have at least two species, ions and, uh, and electrons, or positive and negative charges, but we describe that in terms of just one fluid. Okay, so we've managed to write a single fluid description of something that seems like a, a two-fluid system or is a two-fluid system. And then we write it entirely in terms of the magnetic field, and if we, we don't want to care about the current, we can proceed without really even knowing that the current or the current density actually, actually exists. Okay, so that's, these are just properties of a regular um, MHD. So in going to the, the non-ideal MHD equations, the sort of general strategy for how we, how we get to those equations um, is to sort of preserve those, those good features of, of MHD, or that same spirit um, of, the, uh, of the approximation. So in particular, uh, the way we if you like, get to the non-ideal MHD equations is to start by thinking explicitly about having multiple fluids, positive charges, negative charges, and neutrals, and we can start by writing explicitly the momentum equation for those different uh, species, um, which are coupled together by, by collisions. And so that's sort of physically what's going on, and that was the, the physical picture that I had on that, on that previous slide. And the key is we can then reduce that to a single fluid description in the same way as we do for ideal MHD. Okay, so we don't, in most cases, uh, have to consider 
the individual um, uh, species separately. And then we can do basically the same thing in, in, ide in ideal MHD. Uh, we made use of uh, an Ohm's law and Faraday's law, so a relationship between the electric field and the current, and then a relationship between the electric field and the rate of change of the magnetic field. That's how we got to the induction equation uh, yesterday. And so what we want to do here is to derive basically the same sort of thing, but with a more complicated relationship between the electric field and the, uh, and the current. So that's, that's basically how it, how it goes. That's at the, the, the top level, the, the strategy for how we get the, the non-ideal terms. So if you want to really read about how this, how this is done, uh, in, all, in all detail with the steps laid out. Uh, Steve Balbus, um, I think, has a nice description of how you get to the non-ideal uh, equations. And it's in this, um, it's actually, I think it's a conference proceedings from, from some number, number of years ago, which really goes through it all, all, all in quite, quite, deep, quite a lot of detail. So it's called Magnetohydrodynamics of uh, Protostellar Disks. Um, you can find that on, uh, on the archive. So one of these circumstances where the the big picture of how this is done, I think, is, is fairly straightforward. I already mentioned that, and we'll, we'll say a little bit more about it. The actual details of the derivation, I would say, are, depending on how you look at it, uh, delicate or messy. Um, involves you know, a number of approximations, which have to be, uh, have to be carefully, carefully justified at each step. And, and Steve goes through those in that, in that, in that review. So that's, uh, you know, that's interesting if you want to see exactly how it's done. It does mean that, uh, in principle, one should, I think, take care if you're dealing with non-ideal MHD situations, which are somewhat removed from those that are typically are typically considered, because there are uh, various approximations in the derivation, and in principle, one could get into circumstances where those approximations, which in the normal circumstances are valid, turn out to be to be not valid anymore. Okay, so that's just a, a word of caution. Okay, so. How do, we, uh, how, do we get to, um, how do we get to the non-ideal equation? So there's sort of two, two equations we need to get to. We need to get to a momentum equation, and we need to get to, uh, to an induction equation. So if we start by thinking um, about uh, the momentum equation, uh, the basic argument is uh, related to time scales of different, of different phenomena. Okay. So we can start with uh, just writing things down explicitly. Imagine we have um, three momentum equations one for the, the neutral part of the fluid, one for the electrons, and one for the, for the ions. Okay. So these are basically all the same. So we have you know, the terms on the left-hand side as usual. We have uh, pressure gradients. Here we have uh, gravitational forces. So imagine where we have a disk. We think about the, uh, the stellar gravity there. And then on the, on the far part of the right-hand side, we have, some, we have some extra terms. So we have these terms, PNI, PNE, and then their symmetric counterparts, which represent momentum coupling due to collisions between these different, between these different species. Okay. And you can see here, in the neutrals, we have a uh, contribution from the ions, a contribution from the electrons. We then have the other, um, the other terms in the electron and the ion equations. And we assume we're dealing here with uh, weak ionization so we don't, we don't worry at the moment about uh, collisions between the ions and the electrons. Okay. So for the neutrals, we just have these momentum terms. But for the, the charged species, we also have these, um, these electromagnetic terms, okay, which are the same sorts of things we had before. So Ne here is the number density of electrons. Ni is the number density of ions. And then Z is the charge that we have um, on the ion. So in writing that, we've not you know, made any, uh, any particular approximations. Um, but you can see it's a, it's, a, it's, a messy, it's a messy system, or it's got a lot of complexity. And then the basic idea uh, to make things simpler is to note, you know, if we imagine, let's say, the, the dynamics of the, of the ions here, we have a bunch of terms which sort of represent the macroscopic evolution of this ion fluid. Okay, so terms on the left-hand side, the pressure gradient, the, the gravitational force. Yeah, so, so, so these are actually still quite high-density systems. 
so we we should be general we should be all right in that in that sense so there so even though yeah for example we talk about ampipolar diffusion and we talk about low densities but these are but in, in disks at least these are still densities that are you know very high compared to like say you know IGM type densities so so you know those are those are sort of circumstances that might be uh, you know might have more worry about those actually in more high high energy circumstances like galaxy clusters and, and, and things like that yeah so this, so these terms on the on the on the on the left, and the first couple on the right represent sort of macroscopic fluid evolution scales. Um, but these ones here uh, represent uh, faster timescales, uh, stronger, stronger terms. Okay. So the uh, the idea here is to say, well, okay, if the uh, the two terms on the on the on the right hand side, the Lorentz force one and the uh, momentum coupling terms, if those are really much larger than the other terms, then we can just say that for some purposes. Uh, we can just consider those terms and say that all the stuff to the left of those is representing you know, much longer time scales and is uh, a negligible effect. Okay. So if we can do that, then we can actually say, we can just ignore all of this complicated stuff and just say that this is equal to, is equal to zero. Okay. So we can get some relationship between the momentum coupling term and then this, um, this one representing the electromagnetic effects. So it's, it's going to be based on, uh, you know, basically the, actually related to the question we had before, you know, related to the, to the density, right? How, how often, if you like, is a, um, uh, a particle, a particle going to be colliding with something else compared to like the macroscopic evolution time of the, of the system, okay? And so, of course, you can always find situations where that would, would not be, you know, would not be true, but in some appropriate limit, um, we can make, you know, Interesting limit. These these terms are going to be large compared to the to the other ones. Well, that would depend, you know, in principle obviously on the on the system. So it'd be something like, you know, so for example, if you think that gravitational term, right? That's going to be representing the orbital motion around the star. So that will be related to to the orbital period, right? Um, obviously, we could, you know, not not so easy to make an an, an instant uh, discussion of say how big the pressure gradient could be, right? But um, you know, those kind of arguments would give you those those terms. Okay, so we can do the same argument for the for the electrons. Okay, and then so if we just look back at those equations briefly, so here's here's the ion part, here's the electron part. So we're going to do the same thing for the electrons. Okay, so we're going to ignore all this stuff to the left, and then we're going to get two equations, both of which involve the the electric field here. Okay. So one, this one, and then the same one for the for the electrons. So we can eliminate the electric field between those two equations, and we also need to uh, assume charge neutrality, overall charge neutrality. And then if we do that, we can write down an expression for what the sum of the ion neutral and the electron neutral uh, collision terms um, is. And it has this rather simple form on the on the right here. And then we can observe that here we've got the difference in the velocity between the ions and the electrons. And this is related to the, to the current density in the, in the fluid. Okay, so if we imagine that the, let's say that the ions were completely at rest, so they had Vi equals zero, then the current would be due to the velocity of the electrons on its, on its own. So here's the, here's the current density. So we can then... Uh, replace Vi minus Ve with, with this. And then we can substitute that back in the uh, first momentum equation, and we get, we get this expression. So we get a momentum equation um, that it just involves V. And this is the same as we had in, in ideal MHD. Okay. So we have pressure gradient, gravitational piece, uh, a magnetic piece, which is basically J, J cross V on the, on the right-hand side. So, so that's, that's gotten us to the, to the momentum equation. And we've gotten there without ever having to say anything really about exactly what this coupling between the different species actually, actually was. Right? The whole point here is that we basically sort of managed to eliminate that. Okay? But there were, were as, we've, you know, as the questions we're emphasizing, there were some, some assumptions there, right? Because 
we obviously had to do some things to, to ignore those other terms, right? And those hold in some regimes, um, but not necessarily in every regime. Okay, so that's relatively uh, straightforward. Okay, now if we now want to get the induction equation. So we want to get the uh, equation for the time, time rate of change of the, of the magnetic field itself. Um, and to do this, um, you know, this is not so, uh, it's not so physics independent, right? Because the, the whole point of non-ideal MHD is that it is involving these collisions between the different species and the fact that some of the collisions are more important than other collisions um, and so forth, that the species are not all equivalent. So we can't, we can't go to get the induction equation. We can't hope for sort of complete generality, if you like. We have to, we have to get more into the weeds of, of the actual physics of the collisions and how large the different terms um, are actually going to be. Okay. So you can just sort of say in principle, though, how, how, we, get, how we get going. Um, what we say is, let's say, imagine how much uh, momentum transfer we have between the neutrals and the, um, and the electrons. So how, how many collisions how, uh, are we getting and how much momentum is being transferred there? So it's going to obviously depend on the, the velocity difference, so the velocity between the neutral species and the, and the electron fluid. Um, it's going to depend on the, the collision frequency, which I'm writing as nu here, on the number density, and on the, uh, on the reduced mass um, for how much momentum we get when we get um, a collision. So we can you know, write... Uh, the different uh, collision terms in this in this form, and then you can sort of go to uh, your your textbook on how you calculate um, collision rates and collision outcomes, uh, and for a particular fluid, derive an explicit expression for you know how strong, say the or how large the collision frequency actually is for one species colliding with with another. Okay, so that's the sort of thing people have done. So how do we, how do we use this? Um, well, we can go back to the, the electron momentum equation. So here we had, here we did this for the ions, okay? But we could do the same thing for the electrons. We already mentioned that. So we can cross off these terms up to here and just consider these ones, these last two on the right-hand side. So we've got this minus that equals, equals zero. So that's what we have, what we have there, okay. and then we can um, uh, we can we can substitute for uh, the the collision collision terms um, here. Okay, so here we've no, made we made a substitution because the, uh, the reduced mass becomes basically the electron mass when we're considering very different uh, different masses. So that's what we what we have, and that's sort of um, close to the sort of thing we, we might like, right? So here we have, here we have this equation. Um, this is V cross B over, over C, okay? And if the electron velocity was just the overall velocity, the single fluid velocity, this would be the, the ideal, um, in ideal MHD inductive piece, okay? And here we have VE minus V, and if that was not V but was VI, then we would have something that would be uh, the current, or the current density. Okay. So we're sort of making that, uh, even at this immediate stage, this first substitution, we've gotten to something that is sort of getting towards a more complicated version of Ohm's law that we could use to derive the induction equation. Okay, okay so this is the point where we, we pause and sweep everything under the carpet and say, you know, read Steve Balbus's uh, article or, or trust me or whatever, you know. Um, this is not yet <laughs> what we need to produce the non-ideal uh, non -ideal, non -ideal induction equation. So there's, some, there's, a, there's various things that we have to do at this point, okay, which are the things I'm not going to go through. So there's, some, there's some, some, just some algebraic steps, okay. So actually the first thing we do here is we say, uh, let's make this VE minus VI and then add on the term that we've just, um, you know, we've just uh, removed, okay? So the fir first thing we actually do is we just expand this out into terms, some of which do, do directly involve the current, but then have some ex extra things left over. So there's a bunch of just algebraic manipulations um, of that kind. But then we actually have to use some physics to assess which of the terms are negligible and which, and which are not, okay? And that's the part that, as I said, um, is, uh, 
you know, requires, requires a little bit of thinking um, in order to convince yourself that it's um, correct. And then finally, this is, this is uh, astrophysics. So as often happens, we have to suffer some confusion because the notation that's used for the different non-ideal terms um, sometimes sort of feels deliberately, deliberately confusing. Right? So we're basically, when we talk about collisions, we're just talking about the collision frequency between different species, but people use different, different terms to, to express those same, same concepts. OK, but you can do that. And what you end up with is, is, is this expression. Okay? So you end up with the relationship between the electric field and then the, the magnetic field, and, and the current density, which is just the curl of the, the, curl of the magnetic field. And it has four pieces. Uh, it has an ideal piece, it has an ohmic piece, a Hall term, and a term representing um, ambipolar diffusion. And the, the quantities that are entering here are sigma, which is the conductivity of the, uh, of the gas, Ne, which is the number density of electrons, and then for the ambipolar part, rho is uh, the density of the fluid, rho i is the mass density of the ions, and then this gamma here is a quantity called the drag coefficient, which is just another way of expressing the, um, the collision rate uh, between these species. And then when we've got that, we can go back to, to Faraday's law and straight away get the non-ideal induction equation, which then takes, takes this form here. Okay? So in ideal MHD, we just have this, this first piece here, but now we have three extra terms coming in on the, uh, the right-hand side. Okay. Here, eta is the magnetic resistivity, which is just inversely proportional to the, to the conductivity. Okay. So that's ohmic, this is Hall, and that's ambipolar. OK, so that's, that's, the, that's the answer here. Okay. That's the non-ideal induction equation. And hopefully, you've got some sense of how we how we derived it, even though we didn't, we didn't certainly go through the, uh, the, messy, the messy details. Um, I wouldn't say, I would say, I would say no. <laughs> so, you know, what, what, what you need here is you, you need you know, to get to this, you just need a relationship between um, how much electric field you have and how much current is produced. Okay? And so what you're sort of, the physics part you're interested in is how that is modified by having these, having these collisions. Okay? So that's really the, you know, that's, this is what you, this, is, this term on the top is actually sort of the, the thing you're trying to derive so that you can get to the, to the induction equation. So you're basically looking at for, the, for what those extra terms, what the, the mathematical form of those extra terms is. Okay, okay so there's various things you can, you can say about this. Okay? So the first thing to note is if you look at the non-ideal pieces, um, they involve the ionization degree as they, as they should. Okay? So the resistive um, the resistivity here, eta, is inversely proportional to the, to the electron fraction. Okay. This here, you can see the electron number density is explicitly appearing on the, on the bottom. And then for the ambipolar part, the ion density is also appearing um, on, the, on the bottom. Okay. So all three of those uh, depend on the, the ionization degree in basically the same, the same way. And clearly, the absolute strength of those non-ideal terms depends, if you like, entirely on um, how ionized or poorly ionized the, the fluid is. And if we make things more and more weakly ionized, they just become stronger. Yeah, current is still here, just curl B. So yeah, the, the ambipolar part in particular, if you then write that as curl B, you've ended up with a, with a bit of a mess, right? You've got curl, curl B, cross B, cross B. Okay, so you need to think about Think about what that, what that really means, or maybe don't worry about what that means. Um, so yeah, so the absolute strength depends on the, ionization, on the ionization degree. And so there's a sort of a whole game in protoplanetary disks of trying to calculate the ionization degree accurately. Okay? And that's, that's difficult. It will depend on the problem. 
So I'm going to sort of say a little bit more about that in a, in a moment. But, you know, in general, you would need to ask um, what ideal MHD effect are you interested in? And then how much you'd have to wind up these other terms before you made a significant in influence on it. And so that would depend on what circumstance you were, you were thinking about. So there wouldn't be a, a general statement, this is ideal and this is non-ideal. It, it's a more nuanced question. Ah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so definitely it will depend on the, on the scale, yeah. So um, the particular, like the, the omic piece here is clearly a diffusion operator, and so that will be you know, important on small scales, but you know, if there's a large scale magnetic flux, um, that still is going to be a conserved quantity and it's not going to be very easy to get rid of. So, yeah. Okay, so, so that's the absolute strength, and that depends on, on this question of the ionization degree, and so that uh, involves a lot of chemistry, to try to calculate. Uh, it involves worrying about what the dust size distribution is and, and many, many messy things like, like that. Um, something you can say, however, is you can ask, well, which of, these, which of the three terms on the right is more important than the others? Okay, and there's some sort of basic things you can say there. Um, you can think about the density, and you can see that the density, uh, or a density at least, enters on the bottom in the Hall term, doesn't appear in the omic term, and then in the amber polar term, you've actually got two terms that involve the density on the, on the bottom. So as you go to lower density, uh, you go from omic to hall to amber polar as becoming increasingly more, more important. And that, that matches the, the sort of the, the cartoon version of the physics that I gave right at the, um, at the start. Now you can also see that, say, if you look at the amber polar piece, um, so that's called amber polar diffusion, okay? But if you actually look here, we've got three things that involve the magnetic field. We've got two, two, two Bs here, and then J is curl B. Okay? So if you think about that in terms of a diffusion, that would say you've got a diffusion coefficient, which goes as, as B squared. Okay? So how important amber polar diffusion is depends itself on the strength of the magnetic field that is, that is involved. And if you go to stronger magnetic fields, it becomes uh, stronger. And then not visible really in the equation, but there's also some temperature dependence because the resistivity, the amber polar drag coefficient, you know, those are coming from collisions, and collision rates in general have some, some temperature dependence. So there's mostly a density dependence or a strong density dependence, but some temperature dependence. Uh, for amber polar diffusion in particular, there's a strong B dependence. Okay, so you can, you can, you can uh, consider that in different environments. If you do it for protoplanetary disks, you know, a simple thing you can do is you can take ratios of two of these terms. So you can take the omic term and divide it by the, by the Hall term and just ask, given some particular scale, so coming back to a, a question earlier, given some particular scale, which of those would, would matter the most? Okay. And here's, here's the sort of thing you get when you do that. Um, so here's a, a plane of, of density and temperature. So we're talking about low temperatures here and a very wide range of, of densities. And what's shown here in the different sort of shaded regions are different orderings, different estimated orderings of these non-ideal um, non effects. So over on the right here, uh, high densities, the omic term matters the most, then the Hall term, then the, then the amber polar term. Okay. And these lines here are just simple estimated tracks of what the density temperature relation would be in the protoplanetary disk. Um, at the midplane, and then up in the up in the atmosphere where the density is is much lower. Yes, this does have to assume a magnetic field strength, and so this is assuming I think a um, magnetic field that would be a Shakur Singh alpha of ten to the minus two. So you do have to make a uh, an assumption about that. So yeah, so so this is so right. Rem remember we said that the amber polar part all these terms in general, but they do depend on the magnetic, on the magnetic field. Okay? So if you make magnetic field much weaker, then you, uh, you, know, you, change the, you change the ordering of the terms. So really, 
one should be making a sort of three-dimensional diagram here where you have temperature density and then you have a third axis of, of magnetic field strength. Um, but he, here some assumption has been made about what the magnetic field strength actually is. And so what you, what you find here generically is that you know, as you go from close to the star, so this is a tenth of an AU out to out far out, you track across different regions where these, this ordering is different. And if you go from the midplane of the disk up to the atmosphere, of course, the density becomes much, much lower because it's dropping as a, something like a Gaussian. Um, and so you, you get into, eventually you get into an amber polar dominated uh, regime here. So if you, um, you, know, if you go to, um, to Steve's, Steve's article on this, um, he gets to this uh, non-ideal uh, induction equation and then says it's only natural the reader should be taken aback by the sight of this equation. Uh, in a sense, I think that it's not looking very nice. Um, be assured that it's rarely needed in, in full generality. Okay, so that's a that's sort of a encouraging words. Um, protoplanetary disks are one of those circumstances where, uh, unfortunately, it's often necessary maybe not to consider all of these terms at once, but generally to consider more than more than one. Okay, and the reason for that, as I was just saying, is you know suppose we're at one AU. Well, in the midplane of the disk, uh, you would say the Hall effect is the most important, followed by ohmic diffusion, and amber polar diffusion would actually be quite weak in that circumstance. Right, so. Uh, there's, a, there's a reasonably strong ordering. But then if you just go up in the disk, from the midplane up to the atmosphere, you follow this, this red arrow, and eventually you get to the point where amber polar diffusion um, becomes the, the dominant effect. Um, so if you're sort of interested in what the structure is like at 1AU, you've got regions in close proximity where these different effects um, matter. So this, the, the seed magnetic field here would come from the magnetic field of the star-forming cloud that formed the star and the disk in the first place. And so how strong that is is a whole, whole different question. Um, but you know, if you just take the magnetic flux that would be present and imagine collapsing it down to these scales, you would probably actually get uh, a magnetic field that perhaps is a little bit too strong. <laughs> Um, and for example, would perhaps remove quite a lot of the angular momentum from the from the fluid. That's the so-called question about magnetic breaking in in star formation. So you know, we don't think probably that these disks have such such strong net magnetic fields, but it's very likely they have some magnetic field that's left over from that from that process. Yeah, so we don't need to build the field up from from scratch. I think I'm going to defer that to someone else later in the week to answer. They, they obviously play a role, but that's, that's a complicated, complicated question. Okay, so yeah, so this vertical slice of the disk includes, includes these places where different, different things dominate. Um, so that's, that's uh, a complication for, 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 for disk study. Okay, but we can say some, some things about, um, about how this works. So one thing we can ask is, well, um, what effects might these terms have on disk evolution? So going back to this idea of protoplanetary disks as accretion disks, um, how is gas accreting through the disk um, and reaching the star? And there's a, there's a simple argument we can make, um, which is to compare the first two of these terms. You see the first two of them are easier than the other two, so it's good to start with the easy things. So if we just had the induction part, so we just had ideal MHD, then uh, if you're in a disk environment, you're unstable to the magnetorotational instability, which I think we'll be hearing about um, after, the, after the break. So here's a, here's a little simulation of the magnetorotational instability in, in ideal MHD. So this would be the radial direction, vertical direction, the azimuthal direction. This is a little shearing patch of the disk. This is the density, and it produces this, uh, this turbulent box of fluid here. In this specific case, there was no net magnetic field, um, but there can be. Okay. And it makes, it makes a difference whether, the, whether there is or not. Um, I'm pretty sure that this, this one, the movie is being shown, was, was initialized with a, uh, basically mostly a toroidal field, which had no net vertical component and was not, not conserved. Okay, so that gives you the, the magnetorotational instability. So you can ask, coming back to this question of you know, whether it's ideal MHD or non-ideal MHD, 
you can ask how much effect would, say, the omic term have on that, on that effect, right? So suppose our interest is the MRI, okay? Um, is that gonna be, gonna be affected? So you could make a, a time scale argument here. Um, if you just consider this ideal MHD, that gives rise to an instability, it has some characteristic time scale. So here we have H, which is the vertical thickness. VA is the, the alpha in speed. And if we just considered this omic term, okay, so that's a, a diffusion-like term. So it has a diffusion time scale, which is something like H squared over the, the resistivity, okay? On a scale of H. So we say that the, the relevant thickness is the, is the thickness of the disk. The relevant scale is the thickness of the disk. So from a, a you know, point of view of an approximate argument, we can just say the non-ideal term, which is the omic one we're considering here, will become important if this time scale becomes short compared to, to this time scale. So the critical situation is when they're equal. So we set these time scales equal, and that amounts to a condition then on the resistivity, which is just H times VA. Okay. Another way of saying that would be that's something about the magnetic Reynolds number where the, where the system would, um, would, would matter. And if we know something about, or if we calculate how this critical resistivity is related to the electron fraction, then this amounts to a critical electron fraction where on one side, if we're ionized enough, we're sort of more like ideal MHD. If we're too weakly ionized, we're more like we're just damping everything away, in this case, by the, by the omic term. And this is, um, this is an argument that dates back to, to, to Charles, now a few years ago. Um, and the striking thing is that the critical number is, is, well, the first thing to say is the critical number is very low. Okay, so it's something like 10 to the minus 13. It will vary depending on where, you're, where, where you are in the disk and so forth. But it's a very, very small ionization degree. So in terms of sort of, in sort of one way of thinking about that is that saying, well, like ideal MHD in this circumstance is still an interesting approximation, even down to things that are way below what we would normally consider to be an ionized fluid. Right? So 10 to the minus 8 is a very, very neutral fluid but that would be orders of magnitude above this, above this threshold. So it's a very low level, but as we also saw, or at least stated, the actual ionization levels can be even below that level. Okay. So if that's the case, then the omic term you would predict would damp the MRI in protoplanetary disks, and in the regions where that omic term is important, which would be fairly close to the star, it would reduce or suppress the effects of MHD turbulence in that, in that region. Okay. And that gives rise to the this concept of the dead zone, where you know, at some points in the disk, maybe the turbulence has been really wound down by the, the non-ideal terms. Okay, so that's the, the omic part, um, but then there's also these other terms, okay, the Hall term and the, and the amber polar term. And those are much harder to say something really simple about, um, in part, as you can see there, because they have a, a significantly more complicated mathematical form. So in general, the ambipolar term does give rise to, to damping, um, but as we've, we've emphasized, it depends on the strength of the magnetic field it's, itself. Okay, so it's a, it's a B-dependent uh, damping. And this should be 30 AU. The sort of region of the disk for typical disk models where you worry about this is in the outer parts, so 30 to 100 AU, those kind of scales. So if you think actually about those ALMA images of protoplanetary disks that we, we started with, those are images of the disk on those kind of scales. So when you're looking at that, you should really be thinking about, if you think about MHD effects, you should be thinking about MHD effects that are strongly modified by amber polar diffusion. And then the Hall part is, is trickier again, because unlike the other terms here, um, this has actually a dependence on the sign of the magnetic field in addition to the strength of the magnetic field. Okay? So it gives rise to dynamics that depends on how the magnetic field is oriented with respect to some other characteristic direction in the system, for example, the rotation, the axis defined by the rotation. So that can give rise to other instabilities which are different from the, from the MRI itself. And some of those can give rise to, to laminar MHD stresses, so angular momentum transport that occurs because of ordered magnetic fields in the, in the fluid, but not small-scale turbulence um, magnetic fields. So it's a, it's a complicated story. Um, so you could write this, you know, 
One way you can write this is you could write this, okay, so here we've got an eta for the omic term. If you wanted to write the amber polar diffusion term in a something similar, you could write it as like eta A times curl B, <laughs> right? Um, and then you'd pick up, in, in eta, you would pick up two factors of B. Yeah. And of course, one should say that the amber polar term, as you can see there, is not just a simple diffusion like the omic thing. So it has a, has a different character as well as that, but just in terms of a, a simple, um, uh, simple, simple way of thinking about it, it has that B squared. So here's just some, 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 uh, some pictures from uh, fairly recent calculations of proinflammatory disks with non-ideal MHD. This is Hu et al., uh, Beth Yun et al. Um, so this is uh, um, looking down on a disk, um, and this is a model that includes actually quite a lot of chemistry, so attempts to calculate the uh, actual magnitude, the actual physical magnitude of these non-ideal terms quite accurately. Uh, here's a model with... Um, Less complicated chemistry, you can see this has a, has a net field threading it. So the, the, the white lines here are the uh, the magnetic field. Um, and I think, you know, what you could basically say is that, you know, these non-ideal these non terms in the MHD uh, limit, at least, have, a, have, as expected, a dominant impact on, on MHD turbulence. And there's a lot of interest in the idea that you can maybe generate large-scale disk structure out of some physics that's related to these non-ideal terms. You can sort of see that. Uh, in this calculation, you can sort of see that the, the, the vertical field, that the net field, is getting bunched up in some regions and, and spread out in some, in some other regions. So you can imagine that could give rise to a, to a ring-like structure. And then that's actually explicitly what's being shown on this, uh, this image to the left. Um, though here there's, as I say, not just non-ideal terms, there's also some chemistry being taken into account. So there's actually some other, some other physics taking place there. Okay, so a lot of things there, not not fully understood by, by, any, by any means. Okay. Um, I would say if you, you know, go back to those Dalmer images, uh, those may be showing planets, but they may also be showing in some cases um, phenomena that are sort of associated with this kind of physics. We, we, we don't know. This is showing gas, yeah, gas density. So the strongest thing you're seeing here is actually a, a, a snow, line, snow line effect. It's so not an MHD effect, but, but there are some, the weaker stuff is, is MHD. Okay, just then one slide on um, numerical aspects. Um, okay, so if we're dealing with non-ideal MHD and these non-ideal MHD terms are, are really important, then how those are treated is obviously also, is also uh, correspondingly important. And there's, there's different ways that this, is, that this has been done you know, in, in, in the literature. Um, and so one issue is that the, the time scale associated, you know, if these omic terms and the amber polar term, if those are, are really strong, then the time scale that can be associated with, with, uh, with those terms can be, can be very short. Okay, so it can be much shorter than the time step you would need for, for ideal MHD. So uh, people have done that in various ways. Uh, there's an approach called super time stepping, which uh, amounts to taking sub-steps of, of, of a large time step, but not evenly chosen sub-steps, Substeps that are uh, ordered in a particular way, uh, so that you can you can do that more efficiently, and that's one way that people have used to to look at those terms. Um, so you know the, the momentum equation is still is still basically fine. Yeah. So so yeah. Well, you're you're still obviously preserving div b equals equals zero, so you still have that same, basically you have the, you have the same issues, I would say, <laughs> as, for, as for ideal MHD. Yeah. Um. And the whole term is, is, is difficult as well, okay? And the, the reason it's difficult is that uh, that has um, uh, quite difficult high frequency, high frequency behavior. So that in general needs to be sort of cut off in some Hopefully, um, hopefully, physical physical way, and people have done that in a whole variety of different ways. So there is some work um, uh, in using spectral spectral approaches. That's for incompressible fluids. Okay, it's been done for incompressible fluids at least. Um, it's been done uh, in an operator split approach, which would be the, maybe the, the simplest approach you might imagine. Um, often they're needing to add an artificial resistivity of some kind to stabilize things. And it's been done by modifying the flux in the, in the Riemann solver. So there's a variety of, of methods. 
Well, it, in principle, it could be done um, for compressible. The, the work, you know, the papers that have been published so far uh, have done it in the incompressible, in the incompressible condition. Okay, so that was uh, that was what I wanted to say about MHD. So now let me say just briefly, 15 minutes on on the other the other topic of uh, of two fluids. Um, so you know, when you look at these disks, we're looking at at least in th this image, you're looking at you're looking at the at the dust itself, at the solids, right? Um, so small particles, which are aerodynamically coupled to the to the gas. So we'd like to ask, you know, how does that coupling work, and what does that what does that give us for for, for disks? So maybe the way to start with this is to think about just a single particle, which can be you know, some arbitrary size, um, which is moving with respect to the to the fluid around it. Okay, how does that interaction work? And I think if you sort of think about this, uh, the thing that would sort of spring to mind are terrestrial examples of this kind of interaction, where really it's an interaction between a, it's a hydrodynamic interaction between the, the particle and the surrounding gas. So here's a, here's a nice image from a, an old book of uh, fluid dynamics examples, where you have a cylinder moving through a fluid at some uh, moderately high Reynolds number. Okay? And the fluid flows past, and it has some, some turbulent properties, um, and so forth. However, in protoplanetary disks, this is normally not the regime you're interested in until you really start thinking about really big objects. Okay, so for smaller objects, certainly things that are, say, millimeters or smaller than millimeters in size, the particle size is actually smaller than the mean free path of the gas molecules in the disk. So it doesn't work like this fluid situation, because on the scale of the particle, the fluid is not actually a, a fluid at all. It's just molecules bouncing, bouncing around. So instead, it's in this regime described as Epstein drag. Here's, a, here's an expression for it. Uh, so rho is the density of the fluid. S is the size of the particle. Vth is the thermal speed in the, uh, in the gas. And the key point is that the drag force is linear in the velocity difference between the particle and the gas, rather than being quadratic, as, which is the sort of situation you, um, you normally, normally associate with. So you know, if, you're, if you're a cyclist uh, having to worry about drag and going faster, uh, it would be great to be in the Epstein regime of drag, right? Because if you doubled your speed, you'd only get twice as much drag rather than four times as much. Might not be so good if you had to breathe as well because the density would be you know, some tiny low, low value. So in this Epstein regime, uh, you can characterize the interaction sort of pretty fully in terms of this quantity called the stopping time. So suppose you have a particle moving delta V with mass M relative to the gas, so its, it's momentum in that relative motion is M delta V. You divide that by the drag force, you get a time scale. And what's nice here is that in this regime, the delta V just, just cancels out. So this stopping time, Ts, is really just a property of the particle, not how fast it's moving relative to the gas. And you can often make that dimensionless by multiplying it by a, a characteristic frequency. And often in disks, you multiply by the Keplerian orbital frequency, omega k. And then it's called the dimensionless stopping time, or the Stokes number, though the Stokes number can also be used to refer to many other, many other things. So if we think about single particles, there's actually a lot of interesting things to do with just single particles, which I'll briefly just mention a couple. Um, one is that if we just have you know, individual particles, uh, their interaction with the gas disk tends to lead them to, uh, to move inwards towards the, the star. And you can think about that in sort of two ways. Um, imagine the gas disk is basically in a situation where uh, the inward force of gravity is balanced by rotation, but there's also a little bit of a pressure gradient in the, in the, in the gas, which generally, if the pressure is high close to the star and low far out, um, means that the gas is moving at a slightly sub-Keplerian rate. It's orbiting a little bit slower than Keplerian. So if you imagined a large object uh, that's moving at the Keplerian speed, it would feel a headwind due to that, um, that sub-Keplerian gas. But then that would give a drag, it would spiral towards the star. If, on the other hand, you imagine a very small particle that's being carried around with the, with the gas in the disk, uh, it's being carried around, but it doesn't feel the um, pressure gradient, so it's, being, it's orbiting at too slow a speed compared to what the balance of forces would suggest. So that very small particle would be being carried around with the gas at the sub-Keplerian speed, but then it would have a, a terminal velocity, basically, uh, drift towards the towards the star. So this gives this gives rise to radial drift, which can occur on a very short time scale. So here's this dimensionless stopping time. Here's the drift speed in orbital periods 
it can be as, as fast as a thousand orbital periods, so a thousand years at, at one AU. So solid material can move around in the disk very, very easily. And then another interesting possibility is, you know, suppose you have some more interesting fluid structure in the disk, like a vortex. Uh, if that's a high pressure vortex, basically the same, same sort of physics uh, works. A high pressure vortex will tend to attract solid material in, in some appropriate regime of, of aerodynamically coupled size, and that solid material will start to build up in the, in the core of the vortex. And whether that's something that we are seeing uh, in disks is, uh, you know, is, an interesting, is an interesting question. Okay, so go back to these, uh, these ALMA images. Um, I would say there's you know, those simple effects, which really just rely on the gas having some particular structure, and then the solids responding to that gas structure. Um, this is sort of probably what we are basically seeing in some of these images. So in particular, when you see these rings, no matter how these rings formed, probably they are reflecting the fact that the particles are moving around in the, uh, in the gas, and the regions where you see the, the bright emission is where the velocity is slower, and therefore the particles are, are piling up. Okay, so, so we may well be seeing uh, that sort of single particle interaction between the gas directly in these images. And then here, you have a system where there's a big asymmetry in the uh, emission on one side, significant asymmetry. Um, you know, a popular interpretation is that when you see things like this, perhaps this is actually reflecting a vortex-like structure in the, in the gas, which again is concentrating particles in that, in that region. Okay. So, for a lot of observational points of view, you know, already just having, a, having just particles that are responding passively to the gas is already a very, interesting, um, a very interesting thing. However, there are other interesting things that occur when we think uh, explicitly about like, fully coupled two fluid systems, where we don't just worry about how the particles respond to the gas, but how the gas responds to the particles. And so what we're thinking about then is a system where we have drag on the solids um, and a non-negligible amount of back reaction from the solids onto the, onto the gas. So you can consider this in various, in various limits. And I'll just mention one, which uh, um, is important from sort of analytic point of view. Uh, a simple limit where you consider that the gas is incompressible and the dust or the particles are represented as a fluid, but a fluid that does not have pressure, okay, because they're really just solid, solid particles, not, not, a, not a gas. So in that case, you, have, uh, you can sort of dispense with the, the continuity equation for the gas, just so that the gas has no divergence. And you have a continuity equation for the density of the, the particle fluid, which is, which is rho p. Okay. And then you have momentum equations for the two species, for the particles, for the uh, gas, um, which have some similarities. But the gas one has a pressure gradient, which the particle one does, does not, of course. And then they're coupled by terms that depend on the velocity difference between the particle fluid and the, and the gas fluid. Okay. So this is, in some sense, of course, a little bit similar to what we were talking about for, for MHD, non-ideal MHD, except here the coupling is an aerodynamic coupling rather than uh, collisions between the, between the microscopic particles. Um, Okay, so, so this is one limit. It's obviously not the only limit you could consider for this kind of um, coupling. But in the disk circumstance, this one is particularly interesting because you can analyze the uh, linear stability of an equilibrium of radially drifting solids um, within this approximation. Okay, so the, the state you're considering is an unstratified gas disk, so no vertical variation in density. You have gas, you have solids within that gas, and the background state has the gas moving at a different speed, orbital speed, than the solids. So there's a drag force, and that causes the solids to move uh, globally inwards through the, through the gas. To conserve angular momentum, the gas must be moving outwards as the solids move inwards. Okay, so that's a, that's a well-defined equilibrium state, and you can study its uh, stability. And it was found now uh, 15 years ago almost, that that situation is, is linearly unstable. That's known as the, as the streaming instability in this context of protoplanetary disk um, dynamics. And these are just some, some images from uh, the original paper by Udin and Goodman. So here you've got the uh, relative density of the particles relative to the gas. 
Here you've got the stopping time of the particles, the Stokes number, as we defined before, over a few orders of magnitude uh, in size. And then these contours are contours of growth rate of this linear instability. And for many circumstances in disks, it's not an extremely rapidly growing instability, though it's often quite a lot slower than the dynamical time. But it's present, as you can see here, in uh, quite a broad range of these, uh, these critical control parameters. So something we'd like to know is, you know, how does that kind of instability operate in disks? Um, what happens to it in the, in the nonlinear evolution of the, of the instability? So how can you do this? Well, so this can be represented in, in, different, in different ways, which I'll just sort of briefly, briefly, uh, briefly touch on. So one idea, which is really the closest to the analytic description, would really be to imagine that the particles and the gas are really both fluids. Okay? And the difference is simply that the particles are a pressureless fluid. Okay? So that's one idea, and that could be extended to not just consider a couple of fluids, or two fluids, but to consider perhaps many fluids where the different particle fluids represent different sizes of particles. Because okay? different size particles will respond in different ways to these, um, to these coupling situations. Okay? So that's something that's been done, um, and you can uh, find an implementation of that in the Fargo 3D code. And this is, uh, this is a paper for it. And so here's just a, a sort of schematic of it. You have continuity equations for the different species, and then the velocity, uh, the momentum equations, have uh, some coupling term, which here has just been, been written as F, F sub i, okay, which represents the momentum coupling between the, between the different fluids. So this has some nice properties. Um, here you obviously get the same resolution for each fluid if this is done as a grid-based method. Uh, each of the fluids is represented in an in a, in a, in a equivalent way on the, uh, on the grid. And this is actually the closest to the analytic setup where this streaming instability that I was discussing a moment ago was, was derived. So it's not quite the same because normally here, or often here, you don't have an incompressible um, gas fluid. But you could have an incompressible gas fluid. Now, often, uh, or in the regime where this is valid, this force due to the coupling is, is rather strong. Okay? So you, you probably need an implicit treatment for that, for that collision term because the explicit time step would be uh, very short. And a property here is obviously that if you're representing everything as a fluid, then at each grid point, there is one value for the, for the velocity. The velocity field is, is single-valued as it, as it has to be for, for a fluid. But this is one way in which you can study things like the streaming instability and other possible instabilities that involve uh, multiple fluids interacting with each other um, in the disk. Now, there is a, there's, a, there's a weakness to that kind of um, approach, um, which is if we go from small particles, so very small particles are really very well coupled to the gas. Okay, so they will have some velocity difference from the gas, but basically they will have the same velocity as the gas. However, if we go to larger particles, things with larger Stokes numbers, then they can have distinctly different dynamics from the gas and different velocities. And so what that says is that at a single point in space, we can have particles um, with different velocities at that same, at that same point. Okay, so it's more like, a, more like a radiation situation where you know, at one point in this, in this room, we can have light rays which are moving in, in all different directions. Right? They're not colliding with each other frequently enough. The light rays are certainly not colliding with each other. The particles are not colliding with each other frequently enough to enforce a single velocity field. And here's just a, actually a nice image from an experiment um, from, a, from a German group. Um, so this is a, you know, a real fluid experiment uh, where they have particles in that uh, experiment, and they track them with cameras and look at the, you know, look at the trajectories. And so if you have particles that are decoupled enough from the gas, they can be moving um, basically in the same volume um, with different velocities. So there's a different um, interpretation or a different implementation where you treat the gas as a, as a compressible fluid, or compressible or incompressible, but you represent the solid as the solid component as discrete particles. And these would rep be, uh, you know, these wouldn't be one particle for each dust particle in the disk. Um, each of the, the particles would, of course, represent in reality a very large number of, of the physical particles. And in this situation, uh, you have to do things a little bit differently. So you then have, you know, this is the gas grid cell. Here are the, here are the particles here. And the basic idea would be that you interpolate the um, gas quantities to the location of the particles. And then you take the gas, the, the particle properties, and you uh, interpolate them back onto the, onto the gas grid to treat the momentum coupling terms. 
and you can then go on. If you want to do self-gravity, you can have some, some solver for the self-gravity of the, of the solids and for the self-gravity of the gas, if you, um, if you wish. So other studies of the, um, the, some, these instabilities with Athena and, and with pencil um, have mostly been based on this, this particles-like description. And of course, it has advantages and, and disadvantages. Um, it's certainly more physically accurate if you get to these large particles. Um, you have resolution that's different in different, different places then because the particles will settle and concentrate, which may be good or, or, or not so good. Um, it introduces different, different considerations um, for parallelization and so forth because the particles here can, can uh, all be concentrated in a relatively small number of Greek cells. So there's various, various considerations. But I can just show you what, what this sort of thing looks like. Um, so this is nonlinear evolution of the streaming instability, including self-gravity. So here's, uh, this would be the radial direction. This would be the, the vertical, the um, azimuthal direction, the orbital direction. And the colors here that you're looking at um, are just the overdensity of solids compared to the um, initial value. So you're seeing initially this um, instability uh, developing. Different panels are, are different parameters, which we don't, we don't need, to, uh, need to get into. Uh, and the way it tends to work is that you first produce almost axisymmetric streams of particle overdensity, which are showing up in that rightmost movie first. And then within those, you form dense clumps of material, which can become dense enough to potentially collapse under, under self-gravity. So uh, we and others are looking at this as a way of making planetesimals. So these are kilometer or 100 kilometer sized um, objects um, by concentrating small solids, maybe centimeter sized solids, into very large clusters, which then collapse under, under self-gravity. And that's what's, that's what's happened in these, um, in these kind of simulations. So this is the kind of thing people are doing. Um, I should say that there are you know, many challenges in this kind of area as well. Um, you know, you've made some, some dense things in these simulations, but if you asked what's the density of those very dense clumps, it's very, very small compared to the material density of, a, of an asteroid or a comet. So in reality, those objects would have to collapse down many, well, at least a couple of orders of magnitude more in spatial scale. And so this involves the same sort of multi-scale problem that we were, we were discussing uh, yesterday. And then there's some other problems here. Uh, maybe C, this scale here is, is the uh, in units of the disk scale height. These are very small little boxes because this is a fairly small scale instability. So in addition to going to smaller scales to really see things collapsing down to, to planetesimals, You'd also actually like larger scales to embed this uh, in the context of the, uh, the protoplanetary disk. So those are, those are aspects that, that remain to be done for, for future work. OK, I think I will stop there and uh, take any more questions. Um, so, so electric charges on, on yeah. Um, we don't often consider that. Um, for, you know, the, the, the dust particles will be charged. Um, we might have to consider it. So there's various places where we might have to consider it. We might have to consider, in some cases, um, the charge carriers could be dust rather than molecules. Okay, so, um, for example, in that plot I made of the different non-ideal MHD regimes uh, in a disk, you know, that made an explicit assumption about what the charge carriers were. Okay? And so it would alter things if, that, if, if dust were the charge carriers. Um, there might be some circumstances where the actual elec elec electric forces you know, also are, are important. I mean, they're, they're certainly important in, in determining th whether things stick and so forth on sort of microphysics at that level. Um, there might be some circumstances where, th where, where the, the charge directly matters, you know, its interaction with the magnetic field matters. But that's not very often considered, I would say, or, or rarely considered. So I would say the general, f I think the most common view is that um, Jets probably arise from interaction between the stellar magnetic field and the inner region of the disk. Okay, so, so for, for sure we know that that these are magne you know magnetospheric accretion systems. So in 
most cases, at least for low mass stars, the stellar magnetic field is strong enough that it's created magnetospheric cavity. So the, the jet launching process close to the star, which is really producing the, the, the jet-like structure you see, is probably related to, at least related to that, or at least involves that at an important level. Okay. Now, there may also be outflows from the disk at lower velocity, further out, and there, um, there could be a mixture of both um, MHD driving, um, but there can also be thermal driving, because if you, if you, you expose the disk to um, EUV radiation, you know, the surface will be 10 to the 4K, uh, so that will be unbound gas, even actually relatively close to the star. And probably the, the reality is that there's you know, some contribution from MHD driving and some contribution from thermal driving. But that would be a sort of slower outflow. The, the jet itself, uh, where you're seeing quite high velocities, therefore must come from close in, probably involves also the stellar magnetic field in a, in a basic way. Um, again, that would, that would sort of depend on what problem you're really sort of thinking about, right? Um, for the specific case of this streaming instability, there's sort of a sweet spot where um, things work well for a Stokes number of about 0.1, and maybe an order of magnitude or a little bit more than that on each, on each side. Um, but there could be other, you know, there are other problems you might be interested in where different regimes of Stokes number would be. Be, would be significant, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So actually, uh, when I was writing these slides, I meant to mention that, <laughs> and then I then I forgot. So yes. Yeah, so there's so actually. So if you like, just like in the MHD case, um, you know, it's possible to write two-fluid thing where you have dust and, 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 and gas, also in terms of a, a, a one-fluid one fluid description. And so that is in some way um, a simpler way of getting at, in particular, the dynamics of the situation where the Stokes number is small and you have you know, very good coupling between, between, the, between the systems. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, um, that's another, another approximation you can make. Um, and I would say sort of in order of physical reality, that's the, the least realistic, but it's also the numerically the easiest, then having them explicitly as two fluids is sort of more realistic, but more complicated. And then dealing with it as particles is what you need to do if you need very large things, but can be substantially more expensive. So as usual, it's a, you know, a trade-off as to how you want to spend your computational resources, resolution, and, and physical effects. Okay, if we have no other questions, I think we should, we should break for coffee.